Hey guys, I'm your host, Alice Pang, aka Lala Twiddle on the boards. With me this afternoon we're, uh, is Brandon Powers, my co-host, and Norbert Franz. This afternoon we're going to be playing with the character generation for Capes, Cows, and Villains Foul, which happens to be something that Norbert is very familiar with as he is a member of the editorial team as well as developing team for it. He's been kind enough to guide us through and show us what the system's capable of. Norbert, why don't you take us away? All right, so uh, thank you very much for your interest. Um, well, you contacted me um, a few days ago and you said you were interested in um, doing the character creation for this game. Uh, like you said, it's Capes, Cows, and Villains Fell. This is a game that uh, Spectrum Games released some seven years ago. So soon going to be seven years because it wasn't in August, I remember that. Um, well, you know, the, the game um, was you know, a superhero project um, that um, we developed out of the second edition cartoon action hour rules, but um, restructured some things to um, to make them fit the uh, comic book genre. And, um, yes. and yeah. that's true. Well, uh, Norbert he Franz happens to also be one of the minds behind cartoon action hour. Why don't you start off and take us away on how someone would go about generating characters? Um, I was thinking one of us should do a random character generation to show them how that works, and then one of us could do a preconceived uh, character generation. Let's get started. So, Norbert, why no, don't you tell us a bit about how the optional rule for the character uh, the random character creation works? There is a random character creation in the rule book in, in Capes, Cows and Villains Foul proper. The character design, yeah, it was, was chapter one here. Um, that basically goes step by step um, with um, your good old point location. You start with a bunch of points, you assign the points to um, the abilities, which the system calls uh, traits. That's basically just one unifying category of stuff, you know, um, and, and they're all called traits. A section in the book where you get, uh, you know, templates, but the templates are basically just point templates, right? They're, they're, they're not um, the archetypes that you sometimes see in other superhero games, because we thought about those as well, you know, but um, the game is just structured differently from um, other games like um, maybe Champions, Mutants, and Masterminds, and others that um, you certainly know. Um, and um, so we we have the, these boxed sections here um, called templates, and um, there are basically three suggested um, tiers for for the hero um, in terms of you know maybe a street level vigilante superhero, then sort of a medium power but you know significant superhero and then the grand you know basically superman level you know um planet defending um superhero so and like daredevil are... the teenage mutant ninja turtles at that street level then x-men and avengers at the second level and then the the superman or fire Justice lord mm -hmm. at that, that cosmic level so yeah. um for those yeah, that so. don't know the system since we're trying to walk you through that means that it translates to 100 points 150 points and 200 points correct that's it yeah okay and, and um, I'm since using, won... sure let's do 150 nice and set in the middle um right from the middle and i'll roll a d3 to see which of the 150 templates uh oh I guess D6. I'll roll a D6 to see which of the 150 templates I get. Uh, I'm only seeing four on page six. Are you I'm seeing doing, more? I'm, I went into the main book, like uh, he was suggesting, Cape Cows and Villains Foul, and page 42 to uh, 42 on. Oh. So page 43 has three of them. Page yeah. 44 has three of them. So since I'm doing a random generated character, I will go and randomly generate which of these templates I will Cut. start Just with. Just right. Mm-hmm. And it tells me that I should roll. I should start with template number six. So I'll do that. The 150 point template uh, that I rolled up is a normal human with world class abilities of equipment or an experienced character whose powers themselves are not earth shattering, but has been around long enough to be able to use them in an interesting and efficient ways. Allocate. Um, so then we have four bullet points. And Brandon, there, there it is with Brandon. 
And the it's four- the you said you rolled a six, right? I rolled a six, yes. So okay. allocating auto defend to any trait is going to be three points. Allocate incapacitate to any trait two points. Allocate three versatile slots nine points. Allocate two situational boosts four points. Uh, before we get go any further, Norbert, can you explain what those bullet points mean? All the templates um, assume that um, the uh, point total that you are given um, at the very start of character creation um, is uh, spent. You know, it's um, it's you know already um, figured in it, so you you end up with exactly 150 points, um, and um, the uh, items that you see. Um, under those bullet points are um, bonuses. They are not traits themselves. They are basically bonuses or add-ons that you buy for um, your know, X amount of points in character creation. Um, now, every character can only have uh, one trait with auto defend. Um, and auto defend is a very powerful um, tool for you. It's um, it's a mechanic where you basically declare that you can stop any attack or in any danger in a scene of the game um, and and you will evade fully you know you don't take damage for it, you will not be affected from it but you can only use that once per scene basically once per fight um, and your trade will have to be superhuman or cosmic um, before you can even take that bonus um, but what you know that you spent the three points and then you basically stick the auto defend um, you know, right under that trait, you know, like super speed, you could say, okay, I have super speed, it's one of my traits, and since I'm so incredibly fast, um, my super speed um, is basically my reason for um, evading so superhumanly fast, and um, um, therefore I can I can evade bullets, or I can I can even run, you know, uh, faster than a laser or something, and I can. I can do that. Um, it might also be um, something like spider sense. You know, I know you were talking about Spider Man um, just a few hours ago. Um, so your, uh, you know, Spider Man equivalent might have danger sense. You know, um, spidey sense. You know, and um, you make that a certain level, declare what one of your traits, and then auto defend would mean I can use that once per scene um, to uh, to basically. Um, have my character safe, you know, and unharmed. But you have to declare that. Um, before uh, they, they yeah, tell you how they're attacking you, and then mm-hmm. before their dice are rolled, you have to say, oh, I'm going to auto-defend that, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. And that basically, um, there's the bonus called incapacitate. That is our rules term for something that binds... Entangles and snares, it right? Entangles. Uh, it snares, right? It, it holds them in place. Um, you know, other systems might call it snare binding. You know, or just um, you know, it uh, it immobilizes um, a character, and then that would trigger a different set of sub rules where the opponent first has to free himself from incapacitation, and that's tricky to do. So the first would have to roll against the incapacitation before that they are back in the fight and can do other stuff. Um, versatile slots. Now, it's cool that you got that one with the template. This thread represents a power or device that can be applied in diverse ways, effectively acting as a collection of separate powers, along with open slots that can be filled uh, with other powers during the game. So, um, for three points, you um, get a slot of versatility. And um, then you say what you want to have in the slot. And that is a subpower to, to the, the trait, subtrait, I should say. Um, for example, for the high tech armor, you would say, well, this armor uh, gives me flight. Um, and I know in, in every comic book story that this character appears in, um, I, I get flight, you know, because this armor has jets or whatever. So, um, Flight is something that um, you will always be able to do. You, know, you will always be able to access that um, because you have it as your versatile uh, slot. Um, and I believe we call that a fixed slot. You know that that is already certain. Um, 
and, and then for every such uh, slot, you also get um, an open slot. Um, so um, it doesn't cost any extra points, but um, next to um, the slot we just filled with um, yeah, flight, you get um, basically an, an undefined slot. You know, there's, there's a blank line on the character sheet um, that you can still fill in, in that adventure you know, while the story is going on. Um, and maybe this is going to be, uh, you know, stealth. You know, maybe this is going to be a connection to a computer. Maybe this is going to be another attack or something like, you know, ensnare. Um, could be any of that. You know, it, it's up to the player. As was mentioned, I'm generating the random character generator. How that works, by the way, for our viewers, is that in the chart you have two D12s and you roll a D12 to go and choose which chart, then a second D12 to pick the actual trait. So the traits that I have rolled up um, for my template are acrobatic, brutal, agile, density, invulnerability, veteran, and nerdy. Um, my question is, if I take, so I can now allocate three of my, three of those traits as versatile because of the template I received earlier. Uh, if I am, if I put ag uh, acrobatics for versatile, would I be able to duplicate stretching powers? Without, I, I'm a normal human, so like stretching can come in a lot of systems in a lot of different ways. For example, for wild card my stretching is manifested as me create creating duplicating myself as a deck of cards so i'm not actually stretching like like reed um in uh, of the fantastic four so i'm thinking that basically if i have um a if i have a grappling gun a, spe a special type of grappling gun for my acrobatic versatile if i can basically use that as a type of stretching and tangle and such like that as a manifestation mm -hmm. You're quite a bit ahead of me. Um, now, um, I'm I, trying to I get an idea that, of how yeah. specific and how versatile versatile gets because acrobatic, you know, if I if I'm basically using a using something I've rigged up a um, uh, a mechanism similar to a grappling gun where it shoots out a bunch of cords and uh, shoots out some uh, some cabling with anchors at the end and then I use my acrobatics to somersault onto a nearby uh, top of a pillar or into the rafters and then I swing the stuff down if I can basically be using that as my acrobatic stretch you know a quote stretching unquote there are different right. ways to manifest yeah. that kind of no, no, entangles and such well, I think that uh, the one of the benefits of Capes, Cowls, Villains, Foul, or detriments, depending on how you feel about this kind of thing, I think that's the question for your GM, by all means, is what does this acrobatic, especially if it's versatile acrobatics, and, what and, does that mean? And so this is why Brandon said, don't worry, Alice is an advanced player, because I'm already thinking things that you're like, wait. Well, and also, I like Norbert's like, you're quite a bit ahead of me. I'm like, said by every GM she's ever had. <laughs> But I can totally see that, that basically, you know, I, I, some, as, as a versatile acrobatic, I somersault or jump up onto the rafters and I throw down like the sash with, you know, um, basically, uh, um, bolas at the end. So, you know, a variant of the rope dart. And so I rope dart down and I start doing tricks that, you know, entangle, uh, doing mm -hmm. thing, the same things that person who is stretching does, because what does a stretcher, uh, someone who with the stretch power do well they have you know they can entangle something they can reach for something they can grab something and so it'd be the same powers but manifesting in a way that i'm a normal human being i just happen to be acrobatic and i'm using sashes with bolas at the end a uh, variant you know it, they're called uh, meteor hammer type of uh, rope darts and so uh, uh -huh. but i was thinking that that would be a cool way of using versatile but i didn't know if either person at this table would have an objection to that well, I would let you do it you know, if, if I were now in the GM for a complete game. You know, I'd let you do that. Um, I just prefer um, to um, to assign at least a uh, trade uh, what tra trade rating. I wasn't sure oh. whether it was tra yeah. trade rating yeah. or trade rank <laughs> um, in in this one, um, but it's trade rating. Um, well, a trade rating of five. 
um, would have to be given to um, athletics or um, athleticism. Um, so because how would that, that work? Would... Because hmm? uh, so how would that work? Because um, you know when because the template I was given it says I'm a normal human with work world class equipment etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But mm -hmm. the trait that I rolled is acrobatics. It says acrobatics seven and then in parentheses three slash two slash one, and then it also says that I allocate three versatile slots. So since I have mm -hmm. so. Um, I vers I'm putting one in acrobatics, the other one I'm putting in nerdy, and the last one I was thinking of putting into ad, uh, either invulnerability or veteran for my uh, for my versatile. But how would you how do you mm -hmm. uh, how do you figure out what a trait rating is? Mm -hmm. um, or if you go to um, that that uh, box with a yellow background, right? It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines um, next to the word trait. You know, they, they each have trait, right? And then there's a number at the end of the yeah. line yeah. that's yeah. giving yeah. the seven. rating. Yeah. I've got seven. Right. I've got seven for acrobatics, and then um, my first five is agile. So you're saying that basically, saying since that acrobatics is a seven, it already beats the five you were speaking of. No, no, that's fine. It, it should be at least uh, five. You know, just for, for um, consistency's sake, because. So, um, yeah. That there, there are those two traits um, at the bottom um, that that have a four, yep. um, and we, uh, we haven't established that. But um, if um, if the trait rating goes from uh, one to four, right, that basically says it's still in the normal human area, right? Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, actually, that's not, 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 that's yeah, that's normal human good. Oh, sorry, go competence, ahead, right. right? Okay, and then. And basically, the, the next four steps, you know, five through eight, um, make you superhuman. Right? To just um, you know, to um, to make this fit with with the other characters and and the other rules of the game. Um, the um, well, in fact, you know, for, for versatile, yeah, no, it's, so it's, it's cool. It's not, Acrobatics no, happens it's, to it's not, seven already. Yeah. It's my first one that I right. rolled. Right. So you have super heroic athletics. You are able to, or acrobatics. acrobatics. You are able to do things that uh, a normal human, no matter how acrobatic they are, could not really do. Even right. though you are a normal. Because I human. have the equipment to do so, according to the template I got. I'm a normal human with world class abilities of equipment or. Equipment well, and that's another thing is that. I know you're rolling your traits, but traits can be your equipment. An example in the book is somebody who uh, basically buys extra extra effect with their bow sticks and they make their bow sticks another trait and so when they use them together they they are really deadly mm -hmm. for example for example you just want to make the um trade ratings as high as possible in a game situation right um so a five is, you know, definitely above, you know, um, what what regular humans do in this game. But there are very few regular humans in Apes, Carls, and Villains Fell. Um, now, something like being super smart, you know, or the, the super genius, that also um, need not stop at a four. You, know, you can make that a seven or eight, nine, you know, even more. Um, and the same thing with super strength. Um, or super gadgets, you know, super weapons. Um, they would just be more expensive if you make the, the base trade rating higher. Um, and your ver versatile slots could also be given to, to other traits. So yeah, I think that she was just trying to identify which of her traits she saw that versatility going yeah. to and that nerdy could be applied in many different ways automatically but i wanted to demonstrate for the audience and for you know mm -hmm. asking what you as the creator and such like that think of how it would be possible to use acrobatics in a versatile way this is actually a question i get from people uh who i deal with playing with both when i'm i deal with what i'm asked by gms who've gm for me as well as fellow players why do you think of the things you do? I can't explain that, but this is an example of the things I think of. 
Well, so and what I might think if you're if you're applying acrobatic uh, versatile and I like I say, Alice and I haven't played this game in you know probably six years. I know I guess. it's been a long time. Um, so I, I'm a little. We had a great session of it. I actually remember parts of it very very well. Uh, but um, <laughs> that you might have sports medicine that you'd be able to use your acrobatic on, and that you might be able to say, well, acrobatics those are linked to like martial arts type stuff. I've got you know I can do. Uh, uh, breathing exercises and stuff like this that maybe just being acrobatic might not teach you um in in and of itself and start applying things like that i find it funny that you you get three versatile slots as a as a normal human but then again what you rolled up is uh is a bit random for that well, yeah. I believe my character is done. I am, um, uh, as far as the random roll and then my allocation, I'm just going to take a moment to look at what everything rolled up for me and then come up with what I see my character being. I think I already have an idea of an image, but uh, I can go over that with people if, um, after. Well, why don't you go over with what you what you think that you've got here? Sure. So, the... Again, my template was a normal human with world-class abilities of equipment or an experienced character whose powers themselves are not earth-shattering, but has been around long enough to be able to use them in an interest, in interesting and, effe and efficient ways. So I have the allocations I get are auto-defend to any trait once, incapacitate to any trait once, versatile to uh, versatile slots, three times, and situational boosts twice. So I rolled up, in order, acrobatics. I have assigned versatile and situational boost. I have rolled up brutal. What's I, your situational boost on acrobatics? It gives a plus two when I assist other people using acrobatics. Um, brutal. When I, uh, so for brutal, I put incapacitate on that. Agile, I put situational boost. Density, I did not put anything on. And vulnerability, I put auto defend. Veteran, I put versatile. And nerdy, I put versatile. I have my character history figured out. Oh, go ahead and enlighten us, Alice. What, what's your what's your nom de plume? Your nom de guerre? Well, I don't have a name yet, but um, I see myself working for the Phoenix Foundation as a colleague of MacGyver. Oh, sweet. sweet. I am an ex-military tech specialist that was recruited into Phoenix after discharge from the military. Um, I go on special ops, and I have, I, I'm extraordinarily good at getting into tight spaces, thus the reason I have acrobatics. And so, therefore, whenever they need a specialist to get into very tight spaces to disarm something, to reprogram something, to go down the tube or the pipe or the air vent to go find and, you know, MacGyver something, essentially, I'm the one they put through that hole. Because you I are you are Tom Cruise, uh, Mission Impossible One in the the harness hanging over yes. the keyboard where you can't sweat on it. No. Because I can change my density apparently, so I can make myself lighter. Um, and I'm oh, you vulnerable. don't even need the harness. I know, right? I have the equipment for. I have a, better than the harness to get myself up and down and on the walls. I mean, I just looked at this build and I'm like, yeah, I think that's what I am. I, I, cool. can play the, I can play already. I've got, and I actually have a, like an image of the character already developing in my head. For some reason, this character likes to wear red. I, I see like red and like the collars up and yeah, I, I've got a good image. Now, is it uh, the woman in the red dress or is it a guy? Uh, no, it's, uh, a, wearing... it, it's a girl, but she doesn't wear a dress. She wears, um, uh, she wears pants. She wears a pantsuit. Um, actually, like she wears basically a racer's outfit is the way I see it. With red being a major aspect of the color, like the high co uh, high collar uh, racer clo uh, racer outfit. Yeah, high collar red racer outfit, and you know details are starting to come together. So that's the random character I came up with. And actually, it sounds fun. I think I might actually flesh this out and uh, write up a character history for it and put it into my uh, my portfolio of our archive for maybe pulling out another time and trying her out. 
And you're just invulnerable because uh, Mutant X style, you just go super hard all of a sudden with your density control. Uh, invulnerabilities auto defend. Yeah, I I go. I was thinking either that basically I um I go super hard or I go I basically become incorporeal. I haven't decided which. But I think actually it might be fun to go incorporeal since I'm wearing red. So I had the idea of Toro Toro. So they come at me, shoot me, but it just goes through me. Nothing happens, you know? Mm -hmm. Since I'm wearing red, might as well go with the whole Toro Toro idea. Huh. Yeah, that's a lot of ideas. That's fascinating. So, Brandon, what about your pre-generated idea that you are going to actively build? Okay, so I should pick one of these templates as well, it sounds like. I'm going to go with the uh, the one that you don't want to back into a corner. So, 150-point template. Do not back this character into a corner, or maybe this character has a piece of tech that distracts them, but once it gets running. And uh, I I am going to be... Uh, Alice, do you have a name yet? I actually was looking up... Um, some terms, but I actually thought Toro Toro would actually, uh, wait, I wanted to find something that went along that line. So I think I might go with Toro. Uh, Matador, Bullfighter, you know. Yeah, I was thinking um, of Tora, a.k.a., you know, Lancer, actually. Uh, okay. Uh, what jumped into my head all of a sudden was like Picador, uh, since you've got that brutal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I'm going to make Rook, uh, which is short for Rookie. Uh, because I am the the sidekick, basically. That in the Phoenix Foundation, I come in as the young member and am learning under under uh, Alice's character. And so I'm uh, I'm looking at like eager, fast learner, martial artist. This tech that it's talking about, I didn't think I had anything that matched that. But I I was thinking about a shield to go with that rook. That you know he takes the rookie comment. And goes uh, for his uh, nom de guerre, goes uh, rook instead of rookie. Brandon? Alice, you look like you have something to say. Yes, just so you know, the translation apparently for Lancer is Picador. Yeah. So what you said, you were thinking of Picador. So apparently we were thinking the same thing, just in different languages. But yeah, Picador sounds good. And... Um... And so with that, you know, young, I was thinking like some trait for, for young or eager, um, another for like being a fast learner, um, being a martial artist, uh, like I was saying, having that, that tech shield for, um, I get to auto defend on any trait. I get an 11, a trait at 11, which is massive, but it's only when the chips are down, um, I'm I'm assuming, or are all three of these, um, are all three of those ones, uh, the plus two with three setback tokens and plus two when pushing, are those all associated with that trait? Yeah, the way it's set up here now, that they are um, next to the bullet points, right? And then those bullet points affect that first trait, you know, the, the trait at yeah. 11. Um, right. The, Only when the I, chips are down means that the character has to be hurt a little, you know, has to be like close to defeat in the scene. So it's basically when when you've got the equivalent of um, you know damage to, to to hit points or to your resilience, right? Um, when it looks like you're already going down, um, you know that that's where that trait will kick in. Gotcha. Um, right. And then. Um... The next trait is uh, at a nine, and it has a link plus five. What's link do, Norbert? Well, link is a frequent modifier. You're going to see that throughout the game. Um, it's a very popular bonus. Um, in fact, there's also a section in the book um, which talks about making uh, make, making a link, you know, uh, always possible. Um, but um, under the basic rules, um, you you buy that um, each time as um, a, a bonus, a modifier. Um, now, um, a link, um, well, a uh, link um, doesn't do stuff by itself, you know, but it means that this trait um, can be used uh, in connection with another trait. And, okay. Um, that's, that's what we call linking. So um, you declare 
uh, which traits um, from your character sheet you would like to use linked together, you know, at the same time. Um, so um, there's always one primary trait, and that would be the trait that has its full naked trait rating. Um, and um, then every trait you use as a linked trait on top of that will use the uh, link bonus instead of its full rating. So um, the, the superhuman ones, for example, those are the traits that have um, a naked rating, a, a base rating between five and eight, and they each count as a plus three when you use them linked. Um, and that one that has a nine, that's one tier above it, you know, that, that is technically you know, a cosmically powerful trait. And that works as a plus five instead of a plus three. There are only okay. three, three link bonuses, a plus one, a plus three, and a plus five. Gotcha. Uh, and then at the, the end of his list, he, he has uh, a trait at level five that is fickle and not a finisher. So... Go ahead and help me understand those two. Yeah, fickle means that it might not work uh, for you every time. So um, you have your D12, and then before you use that trait for anything, you have a separate D12 roll, just a you know um, plain roll on, on D12. An activation check. An activation. And... Um, if you roll, let's say, because that depends on which version of the file you use. I think it was was meant to be, you know, a seventy five percent certainty. So if you roll from one to three on your D twelve, um, it's not working. Well, it's mm -hmm. not working this time, but it's not next time. Anxiety. Right? right? Yeah. And not a finisher. Not a finisher. Um, that's uh, another. You know, a negative modifier, it makes the trait uh, cheaper um, by one point, by the way. Um, and it means um, you can use this trait for all kinds of things, but you cannot use it to um, pull the, the winning move in a fight. You know, you have to, to win with something else. So, so the, the finisher has to come from another trait. Gotcha. So, um, for example, if you have x-ray vision or super hearing that basically um, allows you to uh, tell an opponent's weakness or you discover something along the way um, you know b before you um, defeat the, the other guy but um, you would defeat him with a blast or a punch or something not with the x-ray vision proper but maybe oh, okay yeah yeah, yeah. Right. I follow yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that would be probably like where quick study might go. Um, that kind of thought is because just because you're you're smart and you're catching on doesn't mean you're going to necessarily be able to put somebody out of the fight. Maybe gain the upper hand to do it later on. But mm -hmm. so quick study on that. Um, on that uh, trait of eleven, with the concept that I've got, uh, that's uh, only when the chips are down gets better if I'm got if I'm really uh, hurting and if I'm pushing it gets even better than that so I mean this can swing at a 15 which from what I was looking at is just massive I mean cosmic mm -hmm. starts at level nine uh, the character theoretically has two cosmic powers uh, and right. so do you guys have any thoughts on what that might be on the character concept Alice I'm looking at you I know you're full of ideas um, cosmic for a rookie. Um, sorry, I was writing other stuff, so I got distracted. Um, well, how about the fact that you are, uh, can you do something uh, along the lines of computer tech? That you are cosmic in the fact that you can find anything on the internet. You are, you know, you're super attuned to it, and you're the super, super hacker. Sure. Um... But that you can only, if you're the super hacker, you could only do it when the chips are down, like it's saying. Yeah. So, so only when the back's against the wall. So, and other than that, guys, we got three minutes left on the bomb. Got <laughs> I got it, I got it, guys. Three, and then, you know, you're the one with like the 10 seconds left on the bomb. 
Yeah, but wouldn't you spend a lot of your your issue yeah. doing things with that as well? So this is more like uh, in Marvel vs. Capcom when you your power bar is all full up and you can do your super awesome move. Yeah. And then so, they like lock, and you're like, oh, sad face. So, but you can still use it when use the power when the chips aren't down, but just at a worse situation, a worse rank, right? No. Oh, okay. Well then. It gets better the worse off that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And that's something that gave me that very sidekick feel is that like the sidekick might get beaten up, beaten up, beaten up. But then all of a sudden they come back into action, you know, and they're well, they're then, there for. Then if only when the chips are down, point. I'd say brutal. You know, you're like uh, you, you just keep taking it, taking it, taking it. And then you're just the one that's like, you know, that you're on the ground and you just put one hand on the ground and you look up and blood's coming off your chin, coming out your nose, out of your ear, and you just look up at the guy and you put your <laughs> other hand on the ground and you just pull yourself up on, you know, to your feet and you deck him and it's just the one shot that you knock the guy out and he was like looking pretty full. And a very good description of, um, you know, the, uh, um, the beaten down character, you know, the, the suffering character that, that um, you know, has to go through the, the setbacks and, and, and the suffering, you know, for, for his abilities to increase. Yeah, well, you know, the right. classic action yeah. movie type thing is that uh, you're just making them stronger, which I, I had one more question. I do, do believe I follow this, but at the end of the trait lines, you've got the numbers of like one, two, three, or one, one, one. And this is just the, in Capes, Cows, Villains, Foul, the more that you use something, the less effective it gets theoretically. But on the the lines that say one, two, and then three, that's that as you're using it, you actually power up with that. If, uh-huh. uh, but if it's three, two, one, you're, you're losing dice as you're using it more, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right on that. Um, now this is something we haven't, previously explained to the listeners, um, the traits are organized in such a fashion that um, um, you basically don't want them used too often uh, in a scene, right? Because um, the the meta-fiction of Capes, Cowls, and Villains Fell is that these things take place in a comic book that someone bought, you know, someone is reading, probably uh, a young person, and um, you want to keep these heroes interesting because if uh, Superman defeated every menace, you know, with the heat vision, that wouldn't make a very exciting comic book. Um, also, it wouldn't make a very exciting role-playing game. It would just go, oh yeah, heat blast, heat blast, heat blast. You know, I, I, I always win with that. Um, so um, while you have room for, for all these crazy superpowers, um, you want to have some variation going on, and, and there will be situations where you you cannot you pull out a win with uh, with your favorite move or your favorite ability, and then you have to go for a combo or you have to use something else. So um, the traits sort of atrophy, but I have to be very careful with explaining this because then um, you know uh, some gamers assume that um, it's not so much fun if you first create you know, super abilities for your traits, and then um, they, um, they, they, you know, decrease, they, they atrophy, get, get worse, you know, very quickly. Now, um, you have to remember that the game is broken up into scenes, and um, the, the traits get used and, and used up only per scene. So once the scene is over, everything is renewed, right? So it's actually switch to a new scene. Really- Right. Yeah, it's actually something I... Sorry, Norbert, I thought you actually were pausing. Mm-hmm. I apologize. I, it's something I really liked I, about really Capes, like, uh, Cows and Villains uh, Foul when we played it six years ago because I am someone that likes to vary things like, up, and so this um, actually gives me a perk to up. doing that. In Mutants and Masterminds, we just uh, had a group on the one-shot this week that went up against uh, basically like a Sentinel, and they tried to take the Sentinel out piece by piece rather than just saying, oh, I'm going to punch him for damage. And I, I loved the scene that was playing out. And I was trying to vary up the Sentinel's powers before, even before that. All right. Yeah. Um, now, now I know what you mean by Sentinels. So the, the, the giant yeah, X-Men type Sentinels. It, okay. it, was, it wasn't, you know, in the, the Marvel Universe, but the, the same kind of idea of that mm-hmm. big droid that, you know, you need to beat up. and. Or, it made a really awesome scene. 
or the big fight that I gave you guys with um, uh, this past week in Superhero Shorts, where I was my villains had a lot of different abilities. The most focused um, power abilities was the one boss, but all of the other guys in that fight had a very large pool of different abilities. And when I build super characters, super red characters, I try to make certain I have at least three powers because I like a varied op set of options. Yeah. All right, so listening to you guys and uh, with my own thoughts, I think I've got uh, Rook worked out here. Um, and the the two things that are really the defining aspect in my mind was the uh, the shield because of the name Rook. And I like that as, uh, an, as an evolution of Rookie being the sidekick. Um, and so I, I went with uh, having a, a shield. And I decided to make it like a, a force shield. Kind of like Captain America gets at some points that Iron Man develops for him. The other one, I ended up changing the the bottom, uh, the the fickle and not a finisher. I changed that over to pacifist dreamer um, because of this this uh, the the chips are down ability and what what you know really sets the person off. And rather than just being brutal, which would be you know at that point the the Batman character and the Robin character would be hitting on that same brutal trait. Uh, and I don't want to do that. I thought that, you know, if you make them more of a pacifist that's trying to work towards a better world and is willing to fight but is holding back power until the chips are down, that that kind of made it interesting. So the way that it ended up being is I have a at 11, which is only when the chips are down, gets better when I've got three setback tokens and I can only take four without getting uh, taken out of the scene and plus two when I push is uh, my force construct assault. And that's where I take this force energy that I'm, I'm using uh, and I, I put it on the offensive rather than just the defensive. And it gets really nasty, but I'm not wanting as a person to, to take on that kind of assault uh, to do that. So it's only when it really matters that I would look at that. Uh, at nine, I've got my Argent shield, Argent being uh, the, the uh, force energy shield. Um, at eight, it's a uh, tech genius since I, I have to have come up with this shield to make me a valuable member of the Phoenix foundation and where I might not, uh, you, you, the, uh, Alice's, uh, Picador, uh, is more of a, a, you know, nerdy, uh, versatile and such. I'm fairly focused in what I'm good at. At five, I've got young and eager that, that, you know, plucky sidekick kind of attitude that can, be pulled upon and try and get some sort of defense or offense off that. And another, my other five is martial artist and the last ability being the pacifist dreamer. That's the, the fickle, not a finisher, almost everything, but I think everything, but the only when the chips are down are link abilities. And so they work really well when you use them as secondaries rather than the, the primaries um, mm -hmm. on a skill. And so the, the character works just in that they, they build up a lot uh, towards a big, you know, a, a big kabam if, if they need it. And I thought that was kind of an interesting approach to it. Yeah, it, and... is. Yeah, it is. Right. I love it. So honestly, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by both those characters. Um, there's a lot you just did, you know, with... Um, these, uh, you know, assigned traits, you know, seemingly assigned at random, but um, you already created a story here for you and, you know, a bit of an origin and, and a background. Um, so... Um, yeah, I'm already playing what, through my, uh, Tora's life. Uh, Tora Eisner is her name and uh, her code name's uh, Picador is as we were talking about, and I've already, like, I'm already playing through what she looks like and the, a day in the life of in my mind. It's great, yeah. Not not every um, person who, who I explained this game to um, did it so quickly, yeah. I was going to come back to the one, two, three things, you know, with um, the slashes between it. See, yes, ne next to the trade ratings, uh, those are the number of dice. But um, Capes, Calls, and Villains Fell does that in an interesting way. Um, now, I, I know you played before, but... Um, I'm going to. Uh, like I say, it's been years. So. Six yeah. years ago. So, you know, barely remember. And I so, played it once since six years ago. Right, yeah. You go to a trait and you want to use it for, you know, something, you know, for, for a task. Um, then um, we talk about um, a usage of that trait. And then you would mark off, you know, um, 
the, the first number in the parentheses. So let's say that the one that has a nine, you know, we know nine is the, the basic bare um, trait rating. And the first time that comes up in a scene, you know, we have a one here. So that means you have one D12. You, know, you roll a 12 sided die and add the nine. You know, assuming that we don't use links, we don't use anything extra. You know, you have a D12 at the nine. Um, and um, well, there, there is basically a flop, you know, a, a fumble um, if you get a one on the D12. And there is a critical success if the 12 comes up on the D12. And what's and the, what effects the effects of the uh, fumbles and criticals, Norbert? Right. Um, if a natural one uh, comes up, it means that uh, the trait just doesn't function in that scene. And you can find your own, uh, you know, in-story um, explanation for that. But it's it's basically not activated for um, for that, that scene or that action. Um, and you have to try again later. Um, and on the 12, you basically get a gigantic boost um, which happens by doubling the base trait rating. So the nine would suddenly count as an 18. You add the 12, you got yourself a 30. So, so now I've got a quick question on my, mm -hmm. only when the chips are down, let's say I've got my three setback tokens and I'm pushing, so that trait is 15. Does that mean it doubles to a 30 or is it doubling to a 26 of 15 plus 11? Um, that one doubles to a 30. Nice. Plus the twelve yeah. forty two. That's awesome. Yes, yeah. That can uh, that can be quite a smashing yeah. hit. H hence <laughs> why hence why Rook is so nervous about using it. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you know you it, it's like your liberty call, Brandon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> She'd totally need liberty. Yeah, totally. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. that would totally be awesome. Now, well, Norbert, can you make it so? Um, the uh, a trait that is I know you can make like if you have crypto the super hound with you that he can be a trait and then you can use him in appropriate places but if uh, one character wanted to make a trait that relied on another character that was not under their control can you do that kind of thing you could uh, I mean that um, just depends on how you write it down in character creation um, the super dog is something that uh, I remembered from a um, uh, playtest session that uh, that I GM'd, you know, years ago, mm -hmm. and that that part was was basically from an email that I'd sent to, to Spectrum Games, and they used it for the book, you know, which is kind of funny <laughs> that that wound up um, in the book because it's um, it's basically what I'd written down in the email. <laughs> um, but, um, you so, are yeah, you are an eloquent eloquent man. The, there, there was a character who had his his own sort of um, wolf dog, you know, like part wolf, part dog, you know, and um, we we made his his dog a trait. So um, instead of making the the dog in, intelligent or a sidekick, you know, um, the, the trait just said whatever the name was, you know, Wolfie the dog, um, and um, you, you can you can use that under the rules. Um, well, um, it's possible that, um, well, you know, some, some gamers want, want to be more autonomous, I think. So um, they don't want to tie um, bonuses of the traits to um, another player or a player mm -hmm. character who, who, who might not be there. Also, if that um, player character is maybe KO'd before them, um, um, that, that would mean that you lose access to that bonus. But, um, I mean, why not? You can basically use your, let's say, the, the Brandon character, right? And um, you would say, I get plus two when doing a team-up action with Alice, um, or um, with, with the, if the, the Alice character is in the same scene, or I get another plus two if the Alice character has taken two setback tokens or something. You know? Yeah. Right. I mean, what, that's... Um, that's uh, and that that you know, just obviously, we're just using templates. You can come up with and uh, start mm -hmm. and customize your character completely. And so, if I was doing that, I might change things around to give it a little bit more of a sidekick feel. And it might be that he's only going to use that force construct assault when Alice's character is, you know, in that hard way. 
and mm -hmm. uh and so that then it's you know not just is am i hurt but is it is the boss hurt that's pretty awesome norbert these two player characters that you just created here um they would also get um two points of ec there's um you know a, a box somewhere on the character sheet sheet um it says uh, you know ec for editorial control now those are your special points or hero points and um they're called editorial control because um the gm is every, called the every, editor right the, the gm is the editor or the, the line editor or something so the the editor in charge of that comic book but basically the players um are also um th themselves um people with with some editorial power so you have um editorial power over your own hero character um so um this is when uh you want to do additional crazy things in the game and um well and i know you've um used similar things in in the other superhero games now um you have two points you know as a default you know and there's there's ways to to get more editorial control mm -hmm. um which usually happens by um playing to your uh, complications so you kind of social complications or um or you know um other complications like oh uh, well you know i'm a hideous monster or i um i have um a body of metal i cannot transform back or um you know i'm, I'm always broke and you know whatever the case may be um so that's called a complication and you can freely decide to um bring your own complication into the story or the gm does that for you it can be one or the other and uh, either way you earn a point of editorial control so um th there are these these extra uh, functions these extra moves that you can perform um but they they cost a certain amount in editorial control page 28 mm -hmm. the editorial control options to spend one editorial mm -hmm. control will give you a reroll let you counter attack recover Absolutely. save mm -hmm. the innocent um and then two will let you avoid an instant defeat two will also give you an editorial twist or three gives you creative control so reroll counter attack and recover are pretty pretty easy to understand um mm -hmm. So's avoid an instant defeat, but what about the save the innocent editorial twist and creative control, Norbert? Right, yeah. Um, I have the right page open now. Um, so um, innocent, yeah. If you if you declare um, you you want to um, use the save the innocent option, it means that you protect um, another character who's not a player character. Um, it could also be a villainous character, any character uh, controlled by the GM, you know, an NPC. Um, mm -hmm. So if an explosion goes off, you can basically pick w one character who's in the scene who would logically be affected by the explosion. And you say, no, no, that character is now safe, even if something happens to, to my hero. Um, so... Um, that can be used on, on literally you know, innocent, on the innocent bystanders or on, on NPCs. Your favorite uh, cat. Favorite cat. Um, yeah, and it says here, a hero can keep an NPC alive by attending to them and spending a point of EC. Um, awesome, what about yeah. uh, the editorial twist? Editorial twist, yeah, um, that gives you access to, um, you know, basically crazy events, you know, something that was not planned in the scenario, something that also the, the GM never thought of. Um, because, like I said, we want to keep these comic books moving and we want to, to bring in subplots, you know, and unexpected, you know, guest appearances. Um, so um, the writer, you know, this is basically Barack Blackburn, who... Um, who wrote, wrote down these things, and we talked about them a lot in playtesting. Anyway, um, he pulled from his own comic book knowledge and his experience with all the Marvel and DC um, characters. So um, 
there there are basically events that that can be explained by well it's um it's sloppy writing or it's um it's overzealous writing you know by um the people who create this comic book um there is a fourth wall break so um deadpool style you know talking to the reader um or the the, the characters suddenly know they're in uh, comic book panels um or it's like leaving the the panel you know and then talking to the reader then there is the uh kind of you, you thought you had the villain defeated but that was actually um an illusion or that was um that there was a lifelike robot you know a yeah, completely yeah. lifelike robot uh duplicate of um of lex luther or something and you know th this reminded me when when i used to play pretend with my little nephew mm -hmm. um um, because he, he had this this favorite uh, Japanese cartoon he, he, um, he was watching at the time, and um, then he he, he later um, wanted to to like act out you know scenes from from the cartoon, and um, then he made me play the monster, yeah, the bad guy or the monster, and um, then when you know this this is this is him as a little kid when he was like five, you know he would say well. And 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 now you you got to shoot your your energy ray or your thing you know, um, and then, okay I did my thing you know and then he used to say, um, well, you you thought you you got me but I was actually a hologram or something. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that that um, reminds me of uh, something when I was little. We were uh, a friend of mine and I were playing guns and. We went and we blew up the RV, but he'd stashed a gun there. And then I insisted that, you know, the gun that he'd stashed there had blown up because we blew that RV up. And, uh, yeah, he had a different opinion. And so, obviously, I just needed to accept he was using editorial control. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the last one of creative control? Is that just editorial control taken up to the nth level where you can suddenly say no more mutants? Um, let me check here. Um, anything that was not planned. Um, oh yeah. Um, you know, th this gives you, um, the power of, um, of rewriting, um, part of the comic book. Um, well, you, you shouldn't change things outright, but you can change a whole lot of things, you know, compared to other games. Um, now, even without creative control, you have all this free interpretation, like um, you know, from from issue to if issue um, and case to case, um, the, the traits can do so many different things. Um, but with creative control, you can um, well, you can give yourself um, a new trait, um, basically in in the middle of the story, and you can change something that is not. On the character sheet, but you're you're, you're rewriting part of the world. You're, you're oh, rewriting okay. part of the scene. Yeah, that so never I'm happens sure. in comic books. That people just <laughs> magically generate new powers. Like Angel can suddenly heal Paige, who died, and such like that. All right. Well, thank. That you. was awesome. Thank yes, you so thank much, you Norbert. Very like much I was for saying, teaching, well, for walking with us all through this, and. Um, Thank you, everyone. Do you want to sign us off, Brandon? Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Norbert. I think it's way past your bedtime, I would guess. What mm -hmm. time is it out there in Germany? Just hitting uh, 2 o'clock now, 2 a.m. Oh, no. Thank you that's, for staying up with us. That's brutal. Yes, thank you so much. You uh, remember, we're all the babies, and these games are our knives, so uh, you need to go find uh, some knives of your own and start playing. Hook, us up, hook up with us on Discord. Uh, Alice will give us the, the link. Uh, follow us on YouTube for more of these videos. If you like this, we do lots of actual plays and just try and figure out some of the games. Alice, what is that uh, Discord link? Babies with Knives is uh, going to be found at discord.me slash bwk. Bye, all. Bye, all. Adios. Bye, thank you.